Wow, this is exciting. I, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. So firstly, good evening. It's so wonderful to join all of you tonight. And this program was sponsored by Boulder Center for Judaism, as well as Chabad of Springfield. So in this chaotic and wondrous time, the world has shrunk. And while we're not sitting together in a hall or in a conference room, I invite you to join me in our show, as well as also in a virtual living room. There's a certain intimacy of being able to join and connect to, connect to the wonderful, eclectic, and very diverse group of friends that are here tonight. One of the wonders of technology is that we can connect and zero in. And even though we may be a large distance away from each other, we're still all in the virtual living room. A few years ago, while teaching Hebrew school, I taught about the Ten Commandments and the giving of the Torah. I was really amazed at how knowledgeable the students were regarding the subject. They knew how exactly Moses looked, what happened, all the details, and of course, many of the details that they were so sure that they knew were incorrect. But they were convinced that they knew what it was like by Mount Sinai and what it was like to get the Ten Commandments because they saw Charles Heston giving the Ten Commandments. During the past few months, the months of quarantine and life slowing down to the life that we know, I became aware of the four part TV series, The Unorthodox, that was aired. And I myself, as well as many of my colleagues, got different questions of how do Hasidic Jews live and, and what's their marriages like and, and how are things in their private life. And I was, you know, I got, I, I was surprised because like it came out of nowhere. Um, and then I realized that there were many people who were really taken by this series and they weren't sure what was fact, what was fiction, as well as what was someone's dysfunctional life. And so that gave me the impetus to speak to my daughter. And also she had a similar um, experience and we decided that we would get somebody who could address some of the issues, some of the questions, and who, who really would be able to bridge both worlds. And I, got, I, had list, I had heard Miriam Lipsker a few years ago at a large women's shlucha convention, and I was blown away. And I figured if anyone could answer some of these hard balls that are gonna be thrown her way, my way, um, that Miriam would be able to do it. So without further ado, to introduce Miriam, I want to take a minute. And since we are all in our collective uh, living rooms, um, since today is the month of Elul, and uh, it's, it's customary to blow the shofar, so I'm going to ask my son-in-law, Rabbi Mendy Turin, to blow the shofar for all of us. And then I'll introduce the speaker after he's done. Mendy? Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful introduction. And we are all uh, looking forward and very excited for the, what we have ahead of us tonight. Before I build the chauffeur, I just wanted to say two quick things. Number one, in addition to the Boulder County Center for Judaism and Chabad of Springfield, also the gift of mikvah which is the educational department of Mikva USA is also a co-sponsor in the evening tonight. They're actually heavily involved and are a large sponsor for our beautiful Mikva in Springfield, Illinois, which is nearing completion after many, many months, lots of work, lots of excitement. It's almost there, it's almost at the finish line. We are just about done tiling. So that's really, really exciting. And Mikva USA is a heavy partner in building our mikvah. They have been a tremendous support throughout. So not just with that, but also with this evening tonight, they have uh, generously co-sponsored the evening. In addition, I would just like to encourage whoever is able to turn their cameras on. It's always better for the speaker when they see who they're talking to. So I just wanted to encourage whoever is able to, that would be, I'm sure, appreciated by the speaker who we're all excited to hear. And lastly, I will be blowing the chauffeur so tonight is not Rosh Hashanah. However, we're in the days before Rosh Hashanah and we have a tradition, a custom 
that the days before the new year, we blow the shofar to remind us that the new year is coming and we got to step up our preparations and we have to make sure that everything that we have to do before Rosh Hashanah, before the new year, we're doing in full capacity. So therefore we blow the shofar. So on Rosh Hashanah, it's most important to hear the shofar then. So I'm going to encourage everybody. This year is definitely different, but whoever is able to hear the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, and if you're not sure how you can do that, please reach out either to my in-laws, myself, my wife. We highly encourage everybody to make sure they hear the shofar. This year, it's only one day. It's only the second day of Rosh Hashanah. It's only on Sunday because on Shabbos, we do not blow the shofar. So Sunday, there is definitely going to be shofar blowings around Springfield, around Boulder, and anywhere else you may be, we'll be happy to uh, help you with that. But today, it's not a mitzvah, so we could do it over Zoom just to remind everybody. So I'm going to blow the shofar now, and um, you can listen uh, all the way from your computer screens. Uh... I want to wish everybody a happy new year and I will pass the mic right back to my dear mother-in-law. I, I see all those thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you should see what happens on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> okay. So now the moment that you've been waiting for, um, just a little, it's a little hard to see <laughs> on a phone. I'm so not into Zoom. I'm really looking forward to the time that you actually will come in my real living room or in my real show. Um, just give you a little, I'm sorry, here, I'm just trying to see my notes. Okay. Um, Miriam Lipsker is a co-founder and director of the Chabad Student Center at Emory University in Atlanta. Together with her husband and eight kids, they have created a vibrant community of Jewish life and learning, hosting Chabad dinners, for hundreds of students every week. Miriam is a dynamic teacher of Jewish thought and spirituality who lectures internationally. She has been passionately teaching brides for over 18 years, using humor and wit to imbue time-honored tradition and Kabbalistic secrets, which serve to enliven and elevate our most intimate relationships. Without further ado, I think you're gonna be really enjoy sitting down and listening and interacting with Miriam Lipsker. After, um, so the, the format will be, Miriam is going to speak um, for, a for a few minutes. She'll be doing a presentation. After that, my daughter, Sara, Sara Turin, Rabbi Mendy's wife, will be um, facilitating some of the questions that came in to us, as well as to, um, to, Spring to Chabad of Springfield. And after the question, after you know, reading some of those questions and, and Miriam answering them, we will, at, towards the end of the presentation, we will have, open up the mic for what, any of you who would like to speak. So enjoy, sit back and enjoy. All right, well, thank you so much. And I think it's really, really beautiful that it's a, a joint unity event. At first I was like, what's the connection between Boulder, Colorado, Springfield, Illinois, and I'm sure some other uh, random locations and then I realized it's a mom-daughter duo so that is awesome obviously it's more than mother-daughter son-in-law rabbis etc but that's a beautiful thing and I'm honored to be here and the traffic wasn't too bad um, you know from Atlanta so what I'm gonna do really the the centerpiece of this presentation is that your questions and the things that came up in your mind when you saw this series are what we really want to get to. That's the meat and potatoes of this. Um, but I will make three um, probably important, but maybe not news flashes to most of you, kind of foundational remarks before we get to um, the, main, the main course here. And um, as Hani mentioned, at the end of the program, we'll open the chat box and any question that we didn't address or you think we didn't address fully or you want to revisit, the mic will be yours, so hang on for that because that's always the best part. Um, so the three points that I want to make before we open up and get to um, the real questions are number one, um, something you probably don't need me to tell you, but I think it just needs to be said out loud that anytime 
Hollywood or Netflix, um, put on a show, a drama, a movie, the ultimate um, goal of the storytelling is to intrigue viewers, to kind of hook you in, draw you in, and provide entertainment along with obviously a storyline, a message, etc. And and in that vein, uh, many things are employed, you know, poetic license, um, all sorts of imaginative scenarios. And I think um, it's very safe to say, because this is all in the published uh, words, that this series, Unorthodox, was based on the autobiography of a woman named Devar Feldman. It came out six or seven years ago. It's very loosely based on her life because the entire portion of going to Berlin and falling in with the music crowd did not actually happen in real life. And many of the scenarios that actually are seen to the viewer and unorthodox aren't exactly what occurred, um, but that isn't the point. The point really that I think needs to be made is um, there haven't yet been, to my knowledge, any Hollywood or Netflix documentaries of wonderful, warm, happy, functional Hasidic families. And I think everyone's probably aware that that's not because they don't exist that's because it probably doesn't make for such great TV. If everyone gets along and everyone's respectful and everyone's menschlich with a few little hiccups, what's the great storyline and why would anyone tune in? So back to what our story is, I think it's very important before we get anywhere to say that the real live woman, Deborah Feldman, had a very painful, very traumatic, very... Um, a childhood and then her marriage and I think a good portion of her life was filled with a lot of scenarios, a lot of issues, a lot of challenges that really caused her a lot of pain, trauma, abuse, etc. And when you hear someone's story, it doesn't matter the whys or the hows, the Jewish response that's appropriate is to hold space in your heart for warmth, for empathy, for kindness, for sympathy. I hear you, I feel you, I see you. This is your story. And what could we do as a family, as a community, to be there for you, to help you um, heal or grow from whatever it is um, that was or is still traumatizing? And I think there's no but about that. When someone experiences pain, and that's par for the human course, no matter what community an individual identifies as originating from, um, that is the appropriate Jewish response. I hear you, I feel you, and how can I be there for you? Having said that, this story does something more than just speak to one individual's life. What it actually does is kind of paint an entire community through the eyes of this one individual story. And that's really what we want to address, because as Khani mentioned, and as Sarah will mention, and I could tell you, so many questions came in that led you to believe that, wow, people really think everyone experiences. So one individual story is true for them, but is it a reflection of an entire community? And that's part of what we're going to unpack. But uh, I did want to just say that we understand where we don't really want to focus on all the Hollywood uh, tools of how to make something really attractive and interesting. What we really want to do is get to the heart of what is the Jewish perspective? What is a Hasidic way of life look like? What really does go on behind the scenes, not just in this one individual story? And that's what we're going to uncover soon. The next point um, that I want to make is just a just to kind of lay a foundation for some basic info, again, probably familiar to the majority of you, and that is that the title is unorthodox, but under that label or that umbrella fits many different categories of people. There are modern orthodox, orthodox, ultra-orthodox, Hasidic, I'm missing a few. Somehow we love to label ourselves. I don't know why it's a Jewish thing. Maybe that's why a lot of the designer labels are bought or sold to or from our people. It's some mishigas. I don't know if that's an appropriate word in Colorado, but uh, it's, uh, it's something. And it probably does more damage than good, but it is what it is. Even under the Hasidic umbrella, when you say Hasidic, it's actually there are more, or at least more, than 60 different Hasidic groups. They differ based on their place of origin, whether it was White Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, etc. And that would have a large impact on how they dress, what their recipes are, what the specific customs, tradition, melodies, etc. are. And so to be fully honest and full disclosure here, I'm a proud Hasidic woman, but I'm part of the Chabad Hasidic 
um, path, which is not one and the same with the Satmer um, group, which is depicted in this series in Williamsburg. There are many similarities, and believe it or not, I'm looking to see if I could get any, like, catch anyone's eye here, but Hasidic, Orthodox, modern Orthodox, or completely unidentifying, assimilated, secular Jew, we all share what matters most. And that is we all are part of the same core soul. We're all part of the same family. We all have the same creator. You could call it God. You could call it whatever force you like. Um, we have the same Torah, the same guidebook, the same traditions, heritage, history, morals, values, how we individually choose to identify and practice those. There's a lot of room for debate and, and divergence. But at our core, we are one family. And the more that we actually focus on that that light that we share and not the things that differentiate one group from the next, the happier and healthier we are, kind of like in our own families. You know, sometimes you're like, how is that sibling, flesh and blood? To me, we don't have anything in common, but what if we focus on what we have in common? It's, it's, it's usually a happier story. So being that being said, um, we will focus on some of the differences between the Satmar ideology and the Chabad one, because that's actually where I am um, personally coming from, but I did a lot of research and spoke to many people within the Satmar community to verify if things are done as the series um, depicted. And that is the second point. And the third and final point is really the main one. And that is that um, we are hopefully going to spend the next hour or so uncovering not what is Hollywood decide Hasidic life or Jewish living should look like, but what does the Torah actually say and teach about many of the customs or traditions or behaviors you saw, and then what was or what was not accurately depicted. So we'll hopefully walk away with a little bit more clarity and a little bit more, um, you know, of a, of a definition of what's the truth versus what was liberally um, presented in uh, in dramatic form, which obviously I think Connie mentioned, it was the number one streaming uh, series, at least in March and April, and now it is up for eight uh, awards. So it definitely did more than interest people. It, it kind of, you know, did a, did a good job on the Netflix uh, scale of engaging large audiences. And we are gonna hopefully unpack some of what does Torah actually say about this and what does actually go down, um, you know, in the Satmar or Williamsburg community today. And how does that matter to any of us who may not be um, in that specific community? So without any further uh, points of introduction, I'm going to turn the mic on to, uh, or pass it forward virtually to Sarah, who has all the questions printed out, and she is going to read them, um, at least the ones that came in prior, and then the, the, we'll get to your, uh, your on-site ones um, as soon as we uh, get through the ones that already were submitted. So Sarah, I don't see you on my screen. But I, I'm on. Impressed. Do you hear me? I hear you and I see you. But I'm impressed because I'm for sure not the oldest person on here. And that means everybody here is tech savvy and learning this whole new uh, scene. And it's very impressive to see everyone with the screens, with the sound. Um, and it's not even like the grandkids setting it up because I'll be honest, I need my kids to help me sometimes with the technology. So this is, this is an impressive uh, high tech group here. Definitely, definitely. Welcome everyone from Springfield and from Boulder, Colorado. And I'm sure there are a few of our friends and family tuning in from other places as well. Thank you, Miriam, for framing this important conversation um, and laying down really important foundations for us to understand. So I'm gonna get right to it. We were sent in some questions, my mother and I, and we are going to ask those prepared questions to Miriam. And as Miriam said, we will open up the mic afterwards for people who want to ask questions on the spot, or you could chat in the chat box your question. We won't read it now, but at the end, we will go through those questions as well. So definitely be paying attention. And if you have any questions, now is your time to ask. So let's move to our exciting conversation tonight. The first question I have for you is that watching Unorthodox, the lifestyle depicted in the series seems foreign and fascinating. Do people actually choose this intense community or submit to it only if they are born into it? So I think that's a great question. And many, many people 
literally asked that exact question, like, are you only there because you have no other choice? And the best way to answer that question is usually, you know, from one's own personal experience. In that case, it would be actually my parents who both grew up in profoundly secular American homes. When I say secular homes, I mean they didn't affiliate with any Jewish movement, no bar mitzvah, no Seder, no Hebrew school. They did know they were Jewish, but their brand, if you needed to stick a label on it, was leave us alone. And we're doing the American thing. That was their uh, expression of Judaism. And so both my parents growing up in the New Jersey area um, grew up knowing they were Jewish, but not knowing really anything about what that meant until they arrived at college, which was the first time that, you know, I think people independently start asking, what does it mean? And is it supposed to mean anything? And how does it inform me? And to make a long, beautiful story, you know, extremely short and concise, um, this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. And the only people, um, at least that my parents could find, who would, you know, say, hey, you never were at a Seder? Come to our family Seder. Oh, you want to know what Shabbat dinner is? Come join. You'll see. You want to know why we're lighting the candles or what, we're, what words we're saying over this cup of wine? Come and join was a Chabad family in New Jersey um, who welcomed my parents who were college students. My mom was at uh, Cooper Union in Manhattan. She's an artist. My dad was at... Um, my dad was at University of Maryland. And as college students, they were just curious, you know, how is this part of me relevant? Um, and so what's interesting about that is over a good number of years, slowly learning, slowly taking on little itty bitty things, they finally decided that, you know what, we get married, let's raise our kids with a strong Jewish background and we'll see what happens. And I guess I'm here to report that they went all in, you know, hook, line, and sinker. Thank God I'm one of 10 siblings. And five of us actually run Chabad houses on campus, which blows me away because not right down during Corona, but on a normal Friday night, you know, as the door swings open and 100 or 150 college students kind of come into our, we have a tent um, out in the back, which works in Atlanta. And any of them could have been my parents saying, what's Shabbat dinner? Why should I care? What is, is this relevant? And um, the reason why I share that is, while that's only one story that for those of you, and there's always some, some who want the hard facts, the hard numbers and the science, um, the latest study that was done was in 2019. So it's relatively recent and it was done in a modern Orthodox community. And what they found, the question was, how many people choosing this Orthodox lifestyle um, were born here and don't necessarily know much outside of here versus people who decided I actually want to live a traditional Jewish life with all of that entails. And the number that they came um, to with this uh, very extensive study out of a few different universities was it was over a little bit over 40% of the people in the, um, again, this was a modern Orthodox community, um, made that choice coming from a much more secular background. And so the simple answer is you'll always have some and some, but there is a large number of people who actually choose an observant lifestyle, while as the series depicts, there are also people who come from an observant lifestyle and choose a different path. And so you're always gonna have um, that kind of ebb and flow or give and take in life. And I think that that's a great starting point because again, I mentioned this, but no one has done a series of the overwhelming um, majority of families who are living really happy, meaningful lives because apparently it's not that interesting. But once you have a real you know, pain and conflict and drama, all of a sudden um, all the other things become you know, an enhancement. And then we get to have this conversation of like what actually goes on um, and that's the beauty of it. Thank you for sharing uh, your personal story, your parents' personal story. It definitely makes it more relatable for all of us. I see my, I think my mother has a comment to add, so we're going to mute her. She just wants to add another uh, piece of information that I'm sure we'll all gain from. So just something really short and that while you can represent what, you know, coming from a different background, and you know, choosing having you know coming through Chabad doors. I just want to you know represent part of what the movie is showing, and I I, I know a lot of the people on this Zoom know me for many years, or you know, uh, they, uh, you know I have a certain amount of credibility that I, I'm basically an honest person, and I say it the way it, I it is, and I, you know I'm I'm I think people they understand that they might not understand me or understand my lifestyle, but that I do have a, living in Boulder for 29 years. 
Um, I think I'm pretty qual. I've seen, you know, lots of different backgrounds of different people come from different backgrounds as well as um, even, you know, I, I feel like I can bridge, bridge some of that. And I just have to tell you that personally, my father-in-law, he's a principal in Kleisenberg. Kleisenberg is in the same community um, as Satmar start, you know, that, that, that's their root community. And um, if they dress similar to Satmar and they are similar, as well as I personally also have a sister who's Babiv. So what I can tell you is that I've been around Hasidic people, not just Chabad, which is the ones that, you know, you might know more, like seeing, seeing um, me or my family, those who got to know us. Um, but I can tell you that generally the Hasidic community let's say the Satmar or the Kleisenberg or some of those types are really generally, of course, we're, we're stereotyping and we're doing, when, when a person does generalizing, you know, you're not including all the dysfunction that will be in any community, but they're an, a nice, warm, loving community and the kids grow up feeling good about where they're at and maybe they're insular, but um, they, have, they have good marriages, good life, and obviously there are some people who don't have such a good life, which is like anyone, you know, can any of us say that our lives are perfect and that we don't have any stresses or hardships or even dysfunction sometimes that comes to us. So it's just a thought and I'm not going to really, um, I don't plan to mix in too much into the, you know, into the questions, but I just have to put that in um, to the mix because I feel like when we're listening to this talk as well as you've also most of us have seen this um, series um, I think it's good to be open-minded and um, I think that will be helpful in the journey um, and it will be productive so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Miriam and also hearing learning through the questions that you all um, that some of you were, were gracious enough to send in. Also, I happen to see, I'm really not tech savvy, but I do have to have a shout out to my good friend, Lisa, who's staring at me, or I don't know if she's staring at me, but happens to be that since I don't even know how to maneuver Zoom, I'm not as talented as my son-in-law and daughter and all my other kids. Um, she um, wrote a beautiful article that you guys should read if you haven't seen, um, and she did an interview with Miriam. So anybody who wants it, I'll post the link. It's in Boulder Jewish News. I think I might have seen that Cheryl Fellows maybe is also with us. I could be wrong. I saw Cheryl. In any case, now I'll mute myself and I'm really looking forward to sitting back and joining this conversation just from my virtual living. Thank, Thank you for me. sharing. Um, and I could definitely vouch for what you said. They're my relatives as well. And uh, they seem very happy, very fulfilled, and not looking to get out of the community at all. So obviously there are stories, but that is not the norm from what we have seen. So moving on to the next question that was sent in, a strong thread in this story is the dysfunctional intimate life between the main characters, Esti and Yankee. I'm wondering, is this an accurate depiction of Hasidic marriages? So, this is this is probably the most uh, asked question. Maybe there's one or two, uh, you know, that come in a close second. And I will um, obviously acknowledge that the pain that Yankee and Esty experienced was um, really heartbreaking and really difficult to watch and really challenging to see a couple struggle in such a way. Um, and you can't help but just feel in your heart um, just sympathy and 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 love for for what this couple had to go through and the struggle it obviously doesn't you don't know where it ends and where it goes and i don't think that any of us who haven't experienced those circumstances and those situation um have anything um to a value to add except for that sympathy and that understanding of the pain that they went through um depicting an entire community as having dysfunctional um, intimate lives, which isn't really what the series did, but many people unfortunately came away with, if this is a couple and they're a Hasidic couple and this is their intimate private life, then maybe that's what all couples' lives look like. And that I can say emphatically a resounding no to, but that would not be good enough because that would just be my opinion. What actually matters is what are the values that drive this community in terms of marriages and private intimate lives. And in that, um, it's actually not something that's unique to the Hasidic community. This is a Jewish 
thing, if you will. Um, when I say Jewish, I mean it has biblical origins, Talmudic origins, um, examples in, Mishma, in Mishnah and all across Jewish thought and teaching that is a very strong emphasis on healthy intimacy, on couples setting side time for one another, not just because they're roommates or they have kids or they have a mortgage to pay and they need to figure out the details, but actually the Torah on many levels um, highlights the importance of um, a healthy, intimate life. And I'll give you a simple example that may be relevant. Um, if you can do this, so I can get a little interaction here because this is the challenge of the 1D setup. Give me a thumbs up if you know what a ketubah is, either because you have one, you know someone who has one, you saw one, you were at a wedding where someone else got one. So thumbs up if you know what a ketubah is. I think we pretty much have a very educated crowd here. For anyone who may have missed that memo, a ketubah is the Jewish marriage document. It is written in the traditional Aramaic. It's thousands of years old. So this is not a new age, postmodern feminist document by any stretch. Sometimes it's beautifully you know, calligraphied and sometimes it's simple and plain, but the text is the same. And one of the things mentioned in this marriage document for thousands of years is the Jewish perception or the Jewish viewpoint on intimacy. It's actually a mitzvah a biblical commandment, if you will, or a biblical connection or, or a connection either between one, one another and, and our creator. And this mitzvah of Ona, which is referred to and mentioned in the ketubah, it says that the groom is committing to promise to take care of his wife, not just, you know, food, clothing, shelter, etc., but also what they call in, in Old English, you know, conjugal rights. It sounds very um, uptight, um, but really what what is interesting about this mitzvah from a Jewish perspective that's unique to a more secular viewpoint is that it's something that is a man's obligation and a woman's privilege. So the woman is not promising. Um, this is the man's uh, ketubah handing, kind of giving this contract to his wife. And what's interesting is there's nothing in Judaism that's devoid of deeper meaning. And I'll only share one tidbit of what I mean by deeper meaning. The Kabbalah of this is, if you actually look at the word ona, which is this mitzvah of pleasure and intimacy, that it should be the glue in the relationship and it should be something that's healthy and enjoyable and pleasurable for both husband and wife, the actual name of this mitzvah is um, translated, if you translate the word ona, it means her time. And you gotta kind of scratch your head and say, what, what, what do you mean her time? What, what is her time? Ona means her time. And what the commentaries actually explain to us is something that's pretty basic with human psychology. And I know I'm generalizing here, there's always exceptions, but what is the generalization? That your average male, the system and processing of kind of getting into that mindset and mind frame of being open to intimacy, usually it's a snap of a finger and I'm there. Like no big uh, uh, arrangement has to be made to kind of get me in that zone. That's again, your average male. And from a biblical perspective, your average female, if there's dishes in the sink and chaos and bills and noise and stress or resentments or angers, I'm not in the mood, I don't feel it, I'm not. It's a little bit more of an all encompass, all involved feeling to kind of transition to that mind frame. So taking that psychological insight from, again, this is, we're talking thousands of years of biblical wisdom. None of this is, you know, new age psychology, but the concept is Ona means a husband has to be cognizant that his wife will need her time in her way, what works for her, her headspace, her feelings, her heart, her mind, and that pleasure and intimacy is something that may be experienced in a very different way for the male and the female, but if they're both meant to enjoy it, they both have to have a greater understanding of one another, and that is why the Torah spends so much time focusing on the what, the how, the why, the when, and what's interesting about it is if you kind of smeared a whole community and said, intimate lives, it would be unfortunate and it wouldn't be right, but actually it's even worse when you have a community that actually values and speaks about it and, and discusses and cherishes intimacy and pleasure as something vital and central from a Jewish perspective. Um, and then to say, you know what, here's a, function, uh, a couple who has a very challenging time of it, and this is going to kind of reflect everyone else. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's like a 
an additional wound or injury to, to this situation. And I want to just say one more comment, and that is that very often from other religious perspectives, but not a Jewish perspective, pleasure and, and you know, a, a, a healthy, intimate life is related to having children, because obviously there's a connection. But in Judaism, they are two separate mitzvahs. Pleasure, ona, intimacy, connection is a separate mitzvah than having children. And it is not, from the Jewish perspective, you can have or do one in order to have or do the other. And that's important to make because very often there's, you know, we live in a Judeo-Christian society and some of these ideas kind of get mixed up together. And I want to just clearly state that there are two separate mitzvahs with two separate functions, and one is not for or about the other, although obviously biologically um, there's a strong link, and we'll get to that. But I just want to say that Judaism does not believe that pleasure or intimacy is only for the purpose of. Um, it is in and of itself a bonding, beautiful, godly experience for the couple, irrespective of the child's uh, uh, piece of this puzzle, which I'm sure we'll get to because um, I know Sarah's got a couple more uh, questions there. Yes. yes, I do. All right. Thank you, Miriam, for clarifying that this uh, was one unique story, but that Jewish relations are supposed to be a beautiful experience. I could obviously, as a Hasidic, a proud Hasidic woman, vouch for that. And watching this series was obviously very heartbreaking and um, disturbing to see this one story of Yankee and Esti and how there was so much dysfunction in their intimate relations. Before I move on to the next question, I just want to say two things. First of all, the link that my mother mentioned, um, the article that Lisa Dickstein wrote in the Boulder Jewish News is posted on the chat, but it won't be here after this um, Zoom is over. So right now you could go to the chat, you could copy it and paste it on your phone, on your computer, on your email, whatever is easiest so you could enjoy what she wrote later on. And my second um, thing I wanted to bring up was once again, we will take all questions after the prepared questions are over. So feel free to even now write in the chat if you have a question or you could raise your hands already. We won't call on you yet, but you could keep your hand raised so we know that you have a question. And when we get to the end of this list, we will call on you and we'd love to hear any questions you would like to ask. So moving on to the engagement of Yankee and Esti. The scenes where Esti and Yankee meet and get engaged seem insane. It was extremely quick, strange, and distant. Does that reflect a real portrayal of orthodox dating? So um, I will tell you that what is universal across the orthodox spectrums is that dating is not recreational. And what I mean by that is whether it's Hasidic, whether it's uh, orthodox, modern orthodox, whatever community you want to zero in on, um, the purpose or the function of dating is literally in order to um, ascertain if this individual, whichever this individual is, is marriage material or life partner material. And the recreational dating, which we see really um, overwhelming our culture in terms of, you know, I need someone to do things with and have a relationship and, and you know, kind of form a friendship, but we don't necessarily um, know what or if the future is uh, going to be the two of us. Um, and that's very common and very normal um, in our culture, in the Hasidic community, the way that it's done, um, generally speaking, and it does sound very um, foreign, absolutely, to the general uh, culture that we all share here in America, is that there's a lot of research that goes on prior to a couple ever meeting. Um, the foundation or starting point for any couple even engaging in this uh, dating, as we call it, is that they both feel, um, the young man, the young woman feel like, you know, I know a little bit about myself, I have an idea of what's important to me, what I value, what, you know, kind of life I'm looking for. Obviously, at a young age, um, you're not going to have it all figured out. You probably will tell me you still don't have it figured out. Even well in your years, you're still figuring stuff out. That's a lifelong endeavor. Um, for all of us, but I think it's a starting point when a young man or woman says, you know what, I'm looking for someone to build a life, a home, a family, a relationship with, that would be the starting point. We're friends, family, it doesn't need to be a shotgun Golda from Fiddler on the Roof flying around on a broomstick, but literally it's um, 
family members um, speaking, having conversation, what matters to you, what's important. And when suitable candidates come up, research is done, calls are made. I know it sounds, you're thinking, you know, FBI here who's doing research, but I always tell our Emory students here that if they investigated even a quarter of the amount of effort into the individual that they are willing to go on a personal date with to the school they chose to attend for four years of college, how many in, you know, interviews and visits and, and research did you do for this school for four years? Don't you think a little bit of that effort should be invested in a um, suitable mate? But the bottom line is that things could look really um, incredibly perfectly matched on paper and then we all know that in real time, this young man and this young woman could sit across from each other and there's no chemistry and there's no attraction and they don't feel anything, they don't feel comfortable speaking and that will not work. That is not the stuff that Jewish marriages are meant to be built on. And so it would be right back to the drawing board. So the back end research would hopefully bring a candidate that shares a lot of your values and maybe history or appreciation for hobbies, interests, talents, et cetera. But the bottom line is that dating is actually conducted um, overwhelmingly in the Hasidic world and in the Orthodox world by this couple having deep, meaningful, real conversations. They go to places where um, it's conducive to have a conversation. So not an amusement park, not a bowling alley, not a movie theater, but you know, a walk in the park, a hotel lobby, and the objective is, this is a hands-off experience, that they are talking, they're getting to know one another, it starts out intellectual, it then hopefully builds emotionally, and every single couple will have a different timeline of how many dates and how many weeks or how many months went by until they both felt comfortable um, to actually commit to marry one another. What was depicted on the series um, was a very, as Sarah described it, you know, it was, looked like a 20 minute shindig where they sat across from each other. The family was already saying Lachayim in the other room, Babka and Rugalach were already out on the table. And it was more of like a foregone conclusion than actually getting to know one another. And what I will say is that scenario um, in the majority of cases, so we're talking over, you know, 90% of the communities mentioned, um, that is not accurate. However, there still are um, individuals and families um, where it's very short. It may be one or two or three times. And it's um, more like to seal the deal because just so you know, according to Jewish law, you're not allowed to marry someone you didn't see and you're not allowed to marry someone you personally didn't agree with, and parents are not allowed to set up kids without the kids actually being in agreement that this is gonna be my partner for life. That's Jewish law, and um, what was shown was the most extreme example of a, of a dating scene, and I think you could probably get a good semblance. You know, Ask anyone that you know who's Orthodox or Hasidic, um, how long did you date, how long did you, um, you know, know one another, and you'll hear a variety. You'll hear five dates, you'll hear 15 dates, you'll hear we knew after two weeks, you'll hear we knew after two months. Regardless, it's gonna be way shorter than your average dating in um, the secular world. Uh, I have students all the time that are shocked that my husband and I own, how could it be you knew after two months that you wanted to spend your whole life with him? I'm dating for two years, then we move in together for another two years, then we're trying to figure out if we actually are still interested two years later. How in the world could you figure that out? And one of the simple answers is um, that when you remove the physical element and all the distractions of the activities and you just focus on getting to know the individual, it makes it a much more laser focused target experience which is much more intense. It's much more outcome driven. And for those of you who want to know the stats, because this is not foolproof and this is not perfect and not everyone who goes through this system will have wonderful things to say. It still has its flaws. I haven't yet heard of a better programmer system, but what I will say is the numbers um, that are out there for this shidduch dating system where it's an arranged setup that the couple then pursues to get, one, to, get to know one another on an intellectual and emotional level and then get married and that's when the relationship would move into the physical um, plane. Um, in the general society, the divorce rate is, we're almost at 50%. There's different numbers for different polls, but somewhere right around there, which is very sobering 
and not, not great numbers for our society. Um, in the Orthodox world, and again, including all the umbrellas, the number is between seven and 9% um, of divorces. So they do occur much less frequently. And it is, doesn't mean that every uh, marriage is a complete happy success story because it didn't end in divorce, that's obvious. Um, but it is um, just a comparison in terms of the outcome. And obviously many studies have been done. Well, how happy are these couples that met and married in such an expedited way? How successful are those relationships? Not that they lasted, but that they actually felt nurtured and loved and, and enriched by this relationship. And there's been many studies done. And again, the numbers are, are telling that overwhelmingly, again, not what Netflix shows are made out of, but the numbers um, are, are pretty wonderful. Not all, not all perfect, but obviously a, a, a very good, um, a, a, for a flawed system, a pretty good outcome. Let's just keep it at that. And I don't, I, there's, there's really a lot more that could be said about Hasidic or Orthodox dating, but I think we'll, we'll close with that there and move on to a different uh, question. Thank you. That definitely shed light on a very important topic and anyone is more than welcome to ask my husband and I, and I'm sure my parents as well, what our dating experience was. It's not something we're trying to hide and I'm sure many of you have heard of from, um, just want to jump already. in one second when my wife about raising your hand it was the virtual hand you don't have to raise your physical hand raise your hand on the sign by your name you have it either from the computer you have the option more and it says raise hand or um, somewhere else if you're on the phone you got the three dots on the bottom you click raise hand and if you click it then until you lower your hand i see it and um after we get to through these questions that were already sent in previously we're excited to get to all of yours plus the ones in the chat box Right, and I'll just, I'll just make one more comment because this is just a universal truth. Some people are gifted, special, you know, gift package that they just meet and know the, this is the one right away and you can come from any background and have that kind of miraculous experience. And many people, obviously the majority, and this is coming from every background, meet lots of people, invest in different relationships. It's draining, it's difficult, it's challenging, and it could be years till you find the right one. And that's a true reflection. You see that in the Hasidic community, it's not people kind of make it sound like everyone meets and marries that first person and they're all married and, and under that chuppah by 19 with, you know, and that is obviously not a true reflection of what really goes on. For some people, it's a real challenge and struggle that takes a lot of time and years and investment. And some people, it just seems to go really smooth. Um, and, and that's really a reflection of the broader society where everybody on this screen, if you were to share, you know, a story of yourself or a loved one, it may reflect any one of this uh, on this spectrum of like really chaotic and really challenging versus just really smooth and simple. And I would say it's a gift if it's on the uh, smooth and simple side for most people, it's usually, you know, a big deal, a big Megillah. Yes, yes, definitely. All right, so we're gonna move on to the mikvah scene. Um, it was a short scene, but I'm sure it caught your attention. Here's the question. The mikvah scene was confusing without much background given. It was also a bit cringeworthy with the invasive attendant and all. What role does the mikvah really play in Orthodox life? Okay, so this is really so important. And what I'll do, because there's two things mentioned in this question, I'll split them in two. The first one's really short and simple, and that is the invasive attendant who's cutting Estee's nails and checking her out, and it's very awkward. Um, I just want to say, if you know anyone that ever had an experience like that, call that mikvah and that attendant by the next morning should have her pink slip in hand. She does not belong in a mikvah if women are meant to feel awkward, uncomfortable. That is not the goal of a mikvah. I know the rabbi um, mentioned that you're completing or at the final stages maybe of tiling a mikvah attendant's job. And I'll just say this because it's easier. What you saw on that, on that um mikvah scene was inappropriate, unacceptable, and should not happen. Has it ever happened? I'm sure it has. It should not. And if you know it has, you make a call and that attendant needs to um, retire um, indefinitely. What is the attendant's job? Her job is twofold. Number one, she is supposed to say amen or amen when the woman makes a blessing, um, saying I want my home, my marriage, my, my relationship to be filled with blessing. And when she makes that um, pronouncement, that 
bracha, as we call it, or a blessing. It's Jewish custom that when someone makes a blessing, which is kind of like a verbalized wish, that you have actually a human being that says, amen, so may it be. You go there, sister, whatever the translation would be. And so her job is to say, amen. That's her job number one, to the blessing. Job number two is when the woman immerses in the water, the attendant's job is to say kosher, that the immersion was kosher. What does that mean? It means that it was a complete immersion. Her hand or her hair didn't come out of the water. This is done in the most private um, way. The attendant is behind a towel or a robe. She's not inspecting you, but when you go under the water, she does do, uh, she says kosher, and those are her two jobs. The woman's job is to prepare to go to the mikvah. We'll get to what the mikvah is in a minute, but this is easier to put on the side. Mikvah has nothing to do with physical impurity or uncleanliness. And the proof of that is that the woman has to be absolutely clean before she goes into the mikvah. Her hair, her nails, every part of her body is clean. That is her job. That is not the mikvah attendant's job. So if you ever hear that the mikvah attendant was doing the cleaning, she's not in her in her lunchbox. She needs to go, so that is not her job. And that is the woman's responsibility to take care of. Um, so that is regarding the attendant. And usually they are kind, sensitive, sweet um, women who are chosen for this job to actually make people feel comfortable and relaxed and, and at home. So that's regarding the attendant. And the more important question is, what role does mikvah serve in Jewish life? And what I wanna say, because really this probably deserves its own hour, but you know, I'll give it three minutes here, is mikvah is central to Jewish life. It's not a side story. And it's so central that even if one cannot practice mikvah, for all the different reasons, because it's a certain you know, time, place, individual, it is actually central, the, the mitzvah of mikvah teaches all of the Jewish community, all of the members of the community, something so fundamental to Jewish life. And what is that? And how do we know that mikvah is at front and center of everything in Judaism? For the simple reason that according to Jewish law, a community can mortgage their synagogue and a According to Jewish law, a community can sell their Torah scroll, which we know is the most holy, revered object, if we could call it an object, in the community in order to raise funds to build a mikvah. So if that's a fact, a legal Jewish fact, that tells us that on God's priority list, what takes precedence? What is the most important thing for Jewish life and community? Obviously, many things create infrastructure in a Jewish community. And you want a JCC, you want a day school, you want a kosher eatery, you want a, you know, a synagogue, all the different things that would enhance and help build a, a Jewish community, a mikvah, a chabad house, etc. But on God's priority list, just so you know, the code of Jewish law, you could check it up. Number one is the mikvah, and you can even mortgage or sell the Torah, the synagogue, to raise funds for it. And the simple question is, why? Why is mikvah front and center to everything. And really, again, it deserves a much longer answer that we have time to give it. But the simple answer is that while mikvah is actually used um, to mark a status change in an individual person's life, and there are many examples that we don't have time to go into, in the context of a married couple and a, and a marriage relationship, how is mikvah used? It actually marks that this couple acknowledges that even the most personal, intimate, physical, sexual part of their life is not devoid of godliness, is not separate from their great mission and plan here on you know, planet Earth. And what the, the format looks like, and you're going to need to contact Hani or Sarah to schedule a full, uh, all the details of how this is done. But the short of it is, um, this system for thousands of years that Judaism has passed down is that um, when a woman has her cycle, and that's individual for her. This is not a communal event. This is her personal life. Uh, and for seven days afterwards, there's a status change biblically suggested or recommended in the couple's relationship. How does that look? The couple hits pause on the physical dynamic of their relationship, meaning they're obviously sharing life, home, bills, stress, kids, mortgage, you name it, whatever it is they're sharing. But right now, from a biblical perspective, the couple continues their relationship hands off, meaning that physical, sexual dynamic in the relationship is all of a sudden on pause. And when the woman resumes um, at the end of this um, period, 
She counts seven days. She immerses in the mikvah. And when she comes out of these waters, these life-giving, rejuvenating waters, there's a reset button in the relationship because now the couple, husband and wife, together hit play on the dynamic of their relationship that actually makes their relationship unique. And that is the intimacy in this relationship. And psychologically, what's actually brilliant about the system on a non-biblical uh, level is that if you can't have something, the normal response is you want it more. If something's not available, all of a sudden, oh yeah, I can't live without it. If it's here and it's available, normal human response is great. Maybe tomorrow, you know, it's kind of like uh, the simple analogy. I, I, I used to do a lot of carpool when all the schools were open and I take a water bottle with me. And if I am thirsty, I drink. If not, I don't. But the day I forget to take the water bottle, all the things, the only thing I could think about is, am I going to go to Trader Joe's or the Whole Foods or the gas station because I'm so thirsty and I still have an hour and a half left in the car and I need a drink of water? Is that because I'm weird? No, it's because I'm human. And human nature is if something's available, it's easier to take it for granted. It's easier to not appreciate it. It's easier to not even partake. But if something's not there, all those cliches, absent makes the heart grow fonder, and I need it, I want it, I can't live without it. This is something that's kind of built into the bedrock of a Jewish relationship based on God's suggestion. And you're probably wondering, all right, Miriam, how is that related to me? What if I'm not married? What if I don't do this mitzvah? Why would mitzvah be more important than my synagogue that I do go to and the mitzvah that I don't go to? And the simple answer to this fundamental question is, this is actually the Jewish secret for how we collectively throughout our history have made the world a better place. And that is that our secret is we prioritize above every other biblical and Jewish obligation, we prioritize healthy relationships, whether that's between a husband and wife, a mother, a daughter, a father, son, grandfather, sibling, you know, coworker, neighbor. Judaism is about valuing and respecting others. There are so many laws and traditions that govern how we interact honestly, ethically, kindly, thoughtfully, selflessly. And mikvah reminds us that even in a committed relationship where you could take each other for granted, you could really do whatever you want. It's your business, right? You could go to a um, cheap motel, you still get a do not disturb sign on your door and it's no one's business what goes on here. Judaism says, no, no, no. In every part of our lives, sacredness, setting aside time, prioritizing one another, valuing one another, appreciating one another is a cornerstone to Jewish living. And that is a lesson that everyone could learn from mikvah, whether they use the mikvah or not. Although I definitely recommend checking yours out because it sounds like it's beautiful. And I also want to put a shout out that the um, partial... Um, I guess the sponsor of the mikvah in Springfield um, it actually has a wealth of information online. My gift of mikvah, you can go on Instagram or Facebook or their website for incredible information. And, and we didn't even hit the tip of the iceberg of how this mitzvah works and what and who and how and all those details. Um, feel free to do that. Or if you're just interested in architecture, you could go to mikvah.org, type any place on planet earth that you ever hope to or have visited, and you will see a beautiful state-of-the-art mikvah with a very different decor, depending if it's in China or the Congo or, you know, the Himalayas. Um, but mikvahs are portals to Jewish life and living because they teach us not only is a husband and wife's relationship sacred, but we all, all of us collectively need to prioritize healthy relationships with those nearest and dearest to us. And I think in quarantine, um, it, we can all admit that ain't easy. And it's a lot easier to get along with people a few continents away um, than the people living right here in my uh, home with me. Um, but the bottom line is that that is the fundamental Jewish value. And amongst many things that Mikvah teaches us, I see we're, we're getting a free slideshow of the, uh, the uh, building site, which I actually love. Um, you could see all the rabbinical builders, the guidance that they are doing because it's very intricate and complicated how it's done. And while these pictures are going, I feel like I have a few more seconds to add to this, uh, to this even though I wish I had an hour because it's such an important subject. But if any of you have ever been to Israel, it doesn't matter if you went to Masada or you did the tunnel tours under the Kotel, there are mikvahs everywhere because ancient Judaism and modern Judaism and Judaism past, present, and future always has and always will include the sanctity of human relationships and prioritizing treating others with dignity, love, respect, empathy, etc. And I see this beautiful um, mikvah going up. Tiles, and this is great. We're getting a full, I didn't know we got, we were getting a full, uh, 
Is this the Springfield Mikva, I'm assuming? Yes, so yes. Beautiful. I hope to one day come and see it in person. It looks beautiful. God willing, beautiful. yes. We we're loving what you have to say, so there's a good chance of that. <laughs> um, so I, am I interrupting you or? No, no. So the, okay. I, again, I, the, I didn't even hit the tip of the iceberg, but uh, mikvah right. is really, really important. And uh, it's actually a beautiful mitzvah that most people who practice it, um, you know, have have really, really insightful and beautiful things to say. Um, in the series, the way it was depicted, I don't think I would ever use a mikvah if I was treated in that way. And if I was regarded in that way, I don't think I would ever show up again. Uh, certainly not to that mikvah. And I think that most people watching are like, why would this woman do this? It looks so awkward and uncomfortable. And the answer is no, that is not the way it should be. And it's not the way it's meant to be. Um, and most people don't, thankfully, don't experience it that way. Um, but again, it did capture the drama and thank God the interest to even ask and to hopefully open up a little bit deeper of an understanding into the wealth and the richness that mikvah that does and could provide. Yes, I'm so happy this question came up because we are building this exciting new mikvah in Springfield and we're so excited that everyone can have the opportunity to use the mikvah. As you can hear from Miriam's passionate speech, there's so much to be gained from the mikvah and I'm going to add on to that enthusiasm myself and say that from my personal experience, from seeing my friends, talking to my friends or people who use the mikvah, um, they're just so thankful for that opportunity and for what it gives to a person's marriage. So um, one last plug for Mikva, I just want to make it clear that even if you are past having your monthly cycles, you are able to go to Mikva. You can reach out to us. We're excited to teach anyone and everyone about this special mitzvah. It's a commandment from the Torah, very holy, and has so much meaning and tradition as well. So we're waiting for our phones to ring off the hook and um, for uh, classes to begin. So after that plug, I want to move on to our next question. And that is one of the most dramatic scenes in the series is when Esty has her head shaved. Is this something all Orthodox women do? And what is the deal with the shaito slash wig in English? Right. So yeah, I uh, watching that scene, um, she acted it amazingly. You could just see on her face what she was experiencing. It was pretty brutal um, to watch. And I think um, just to state facts as they are, um, the majority of Hasidic women, I'm, I'm taking a dramatic pause here because you're probably waiting, do we or do we not, um, do not shave their heads. Um, that is the fact. You could ask any of any any woman you know. Majority do not shave their heads. Not after their wedding, and not at any other time. Although I did ask one person, she's like, "Well, one time I kind of gave myself a buzz and I dyed my hair hot pink just to see what it would look like." But this was not a biblical or religious practice. Um, to be honest, there are um, a segment of the Hasidic world um, in the Satmar community, perhaps Hani has insight into, she mentioned the Kleisenberg or a few other sects where the custom is still um, done and there are still women who will tell you, yes, I do do that. Yes, we do that. Yes, it was and has been done in our family. You will find people today in 2020 who still do it. Um, it is a select, very um, small margin. It is done. What is not and again it is not common but it is still done what is common and what is universal and what you will find done across all the different communities hasidic orthodox etc is not shaving one's head but covering one's hair after marriage that is um across the board um and give me a thumbs up if you've ever visited israel um, I know not recently, but any time in your life if you've ever visited the holy land of israel really only three of you Five, seven, nine, ten. Okay, okay, okay. Now it looks now it looks more accurate. So it doesn't matter where you spent your time or where you visited and what you saw. You probably could relate to this image of walking down a street and seeing women in all sorts, every variety, shade, and color of different head coverings: a turban, a wrap, a big elaborate, you know, uh, 
pile of scarves, a baseball cap, a, uh, you know, a wig, a wig with a hat, you name it, a band, a bandana, every sort of covering of hair. And so I want to spend one moment just to touch for a moment why that is done, where that comes from because that is something that you will find across the board in um, traditional communities. And that is because hair is a $90 billion industry. That was with a B. Um, people care about their hair, color, shape, size, length, you name it. Many people probably don't have their Zoom cameras on tonight because they don't want people to see them because their hair has not been tended to by their hairdresser in the last six months and they're like keeping the camera off. But from a Jewish mystical perspective, um, hair is actually considered, especially a feminine from a woman's um, image issue, it is a sensual expression of a woman's internal self. And because once a woman gets married, that sensual energy is meant to be inward. It's meant to be focused within the privacy of her relationship. So the custom is, and this is something that's actually from biblical times through today, it's not a, a new fad by any stretch, that married women would never go out in public with their hair exposed. Why is that? Because that element of who I am in my most intimate private self is something that's kept private. So you don't need to know if I'm covering my hair and therefore I could choose whatever is about me and how I feel and how I know I'm behaving um, and interacting with the outside world. And that's why you'll see a very wide range of varieties of customs of how it's done. The one misconception that you may have heard is that married women cover their hair so that they should look less attractive to you know people outside and that is false it is not an attractive issue jewish women are supposed to be attractive you're supposed to look menschlich beautiful presentable any word that suits you um jewish women are not supposed to look worse than anyone else if anything you could say let's look better um but certainly not like the cat dragged you in that is no mitzvah that is not the the focus here and that um just because you're you're probably familiar with the Chabad custom. The Rebbe put a strong emphasis on actually using um, a wig that's, you know, you feel comfortable. It looks like your own hair may have, or you would like it to, or whatever, um, for the simple reason that it is not meant to make, to detract from your self-esteem and how you look and how you feel. Rather, the other doesn't need to know I'm doing this mitzvah. I know that I'm doing it. I know that you're only seeing what you're seeing, but the the essence of me is not actually, um, you know, in the public sphere, and I'm protecting kind of that sacredness and modesty within my own relationship, and that's where it finds expression, and that is something um, that is across the board, um, again, with very different uh, choices of how women choose to do this mitzvah, um, and um, that is common. The hair shaving is still done, but not by the overwhelming majority. Thank you, Miriam. Now, uh, you may have expelled a lot of doubts people may have had. I always wonder who knows I'm wearing a wig and who doesn't. Not that it's a secret or anything, but um, if it doesn't come a conversation, I don't, you know, introduce myself. Hi, I'm Sarah and I wear a wig. Um, but you all know now and you know the reason for it. There's so much beauty to this mitzvah again from the Torah and I'm very proud to wear a wig daily and as Miriam said it's not to look unattractable at all it's um, a separate meaning behind it all right so we don't have too many questions left I know that I'm you a lot of you wrote questions in the chat box and I'm sure some of you want to ask it live so we are going to save some time for that I am going to cover three more questions and then we will move on to your questions. So the next question that came in is, in the film, we see how Yankee is very uncomfortable about not having children and Yankee and Esty feel a real pressure to build a family. What role does having children play in a Hasidic family and in a couple's relationship? Okay, so Full disclosure, in Judaism, having children is a big deal. Um, it's, a, it's a focus, it's a value, transmitting our beliefs to the next generation, Midor Lador, passing on our heritage to our children. This is something important. Um, and believe it or not, um, it's actually the first mitzvah, the first kind of directive that God gave to the first human beings, uh, Adam and Eve, was to be fruitful and multiply. And what's very interesting about that actual verse and that actual commandment 
is in the language. Judaism, it's never arbitrary and the wording's never random um, in the Torah. And what's interesting about it is Adam and Eve are told, pru urevu umelu et ha'aretz. You should be fruitful and multiply kind of and fill the earth. And we're all, you know, left with the question. It doesn't say child, boy, girl, baby. It's talking about fruit. Like, what are we, fruit trees? Like, why the wording fruitful and multiply when we're humans, we're not, you know, fruit bearing trees. And the, the interesting mysticism behind that is that the language was chosen specifically because it's a fact that we all know that not every human being, not every couple, not every man and woman will be blessed with children. Not everyone wants children. Not everyone who wants children gets to have biological children. And that's something that's more in God's hands than in our own. Meaning that in our very modern society, people could choose, you know, all sorts of birth control to prevent having children, but you can't, um, and, and many means to actually help fertility, but either way, it's something that is actually beyond our direct control, and it takes a lot of effort one way or the other to make it happen or not happen. And so what is the Torah value here? And this is something that's universal value is, yes, while children are important and having a family is a Torah value, um, the truth of the matter is that not every, um, not every human being is going to have children. And so the mitzvah, um, be fruitful and multiply, is universal to everyone because what it is telling us is as a human being, you may not have a biological child, but that doesn't mean you don't leave a legacy. That doesn't mean that you don't have something to offer, something to bring, something to contribute. It may be in all sorts of different shapes and forms. Some may leave thoughts, ideas, music, art, um, philanthropy, buildings. I mean, you name it. There are a lot of things that you can do to leave a legacy, to be fruitful and multiply multiply can mean a biological family. And in many cases, it means very different things that look in very different, um, you know, colors and shapes. But what is it telling us? That a human being is here to leave an impact, to leave a mark, to leave a contribution, to leave something valuable for um, humanity. And so um, that's really the crux of the issue. And I think that having seen, um, you know, what Esti was made to feel initially from the fact that she couldn't have kids is absolutely cruel and absolutely unjust because this is not something that she is actually even controlling. Um, this is something, if you believe in God and you're a God-centric community, how much or more so you should be able to understand that this is a blessing that's showered down from the divine and you should not ever make someone feel like they're less than or worthless or not worthwhile because they're not contributing in this way. And so that is from a Torah perspective, absolutely wrong. And while children and family are for sure valued and appreciated for those in the community that are not going to be having children because God decided otherwise, that respect and value of the individual is something that Torah highlights and that we as individual communities need to also um, respect. And a community who, who um, would belittle or make a woman or a man feel like they're less than because this is not something that they're contributing is absolutely wrong from a biblical, from a Jewish perspective. Um, and, and no one should ever be made um, to feel less than because of something either in their control or not in their control. Um, that is not the Jewish way, although obviously it's, it's, it's very sad when that happens and it's even more devastating when it happens like in the name of God, like God wants this from you and you're not doing it, but that is not the true facts on the ground and that is not the Torah perspective on how to treat others and how to view others. So I think I see your talk. Oh, there you are. Okay. I, for a yeah, second, that's you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing those values. Very important to keep in mind, especially with all going on in the world today. Moving on to the next question. Where are we? What is the general response or reaction when individuals leave the community? Um, so usually the stories you hear are the dramatic, awful ones, because sadly they do exist. 
like Devora Feldman's. There are also many voices, even recently, um, I've read in the forward and CNN, um, Hasidic women from Satmar Williamsburg who chose a different path, but they kept in touch with their family and they kept the bond and connection with their past, although they chose a different future. Um, the truth lies in this um, fundamental reality, and that is that families at their core behave um, and respond differently to this very universally um, unsettling or, or very hurtful or upsetting situation when a child rejects the values you taught them. This is not unique to the Hasidic community. And the example I'll share with you of my own personal life is when my father decided, he was in college and he decided he was so fascinated with Judaism that he wanted to drop out of school and go to yeshiva. And he told my grandparents who were very liberal and open-minded and, you know, peace, love, harmony, live your dream, do whatever you want. When he told them, I want to drop out of college and I want to go to yeshiva, my very liberal grandparents said, don't you dare. And if you do that, we're going to cut you off and we're not going to pay and we're not going to talk to you and don't even think of doing that. What happened is my dad stayed in college and he went to yeshiva when he finished. Um, but why am I sharing that example? Because it's very hurtful to parents, no matter what values they have, when their own children reject them or throw those values at them. How do people choose to respond? Some do the right thing. What is the right thing? The right thing is, I may not like your choice, but I love you. I may not agree with your taste, your decision, your career path, your partner in life, but I love you and I will be there for you and I will not let the details of you get in the way of the essence of you. That's the appropriate Jewish response. Does every Jewish family live up to that? No, sadly, no, not in the Hasidic world and not out in the secular world. Some families, and there's actually a movement in the Satmar community in Williamsburg today, uh, consisting of a few hundred mothers who have children who are doing all sorts of different things outside the gates of the community, and they're determined to keep a relationship with their child, to keep the door open, to keep a loving connection, despite whatever challenges those decisions pose to their family's values. And I think that's admirable. That's where we need to go. And whenever you see a family shutting out or cutting off or closing the door on a child, it is, again, we could understand that human feeling, but that is not the appropriate response. That is not the Jewish response. That is not the Torah response. The Torah response is your neshama has to be valued and who you are at your essence is what I love and your decisions, eh, you know, I approve of them. It makes me happy. I don't. So, so I love you anyway. That's the Jewish response. And I think uh, more and more, just as a contrast in the Satmar community, the perception was always a very insular one where the gates of the community are very closed. We want to protect what we have. We don't want anyone leaving and we don't want anyone coming. It's like a closed gate to kind of maintain and to keep our values strong. That's one outlook. And so in that community, it's even more challenging if you want to go through those gates to not have them slam behind you. In the Chabad community, which again is also a Hasidic community, the outlook is I'm not scared of the outside world. I'm not frightened that it will affect me. I'm open to interacting and to discussing while still maintaining my values, but that gate is not keeping me protected. It's actually a welcome doormat for everybody to kind of exchange ideas and share ideas and share background. And so in that community, that door is easier to navigate back and forth or in and out of. But ultimately, universally, the Jewish value is if you see another human being, whether it's your child, whether it's your sibling, whether it's your neighbor, as in essence, they're a soul, they're a part of God and a Shama, and that's what I see when I look at you and that's what I focus on, then I never shut the door on you. I might disagree with you, I might not like how you vote, I might not like how you marry, I might not like how you dress, I might not like how you spend, but you know what? You are the person inside all of those decisions and I'll never close the door on you, even if we argue and yell and scream and throw dishes. The non-Jewish approach is I don't like your choices, I'm closing the door, you're out of my life. That is not the way God wants us to treat one another. That's certainly not the way a family is meant to be. And I think in the Bible, there are probably a uh, hundred stories on, in every, in every Parsha, you could probably find the story of a family where there were different people with different decisions and different choices and different behaviors. And the goal was harmony, love, peace. Sometimes it was achieved easier. Sometimes it 
wasn't, um, but we know what the value is. And we know that it's not easy, and we know that there's a lot of work involved there, but fundamentally, um, to say that a whole community writes their children out or a whole community um, doesn't is not true. Every community has families who do the right thing by their children, and every community has families who really harm and provide detrimental interactions that are even more hurtful to their own children, um, knowingly or unknowingly, and that's tragic whenever and wherever it occurs, and we should not stand for that, because that is not how God intended human beings to live, but it's a very tall order to be understanding and accepting when people go against what we feel is right. Um, and that's a lot of work to kind of separate you from your opinion, and I'm not gonna get political here, but we have that today. You know, you're evil if you think this, or you're wonderful if you think that, but the sum of one person um, choice is not who they are at their essence. It's an element of who they are, and we need to respect that and be able to have real conversations, not just about political matters, but about life decisions without canceling and disqualifying the human being that's inside making those choices or decisions. And that is something so fundamental to Judaism and so important to being a mensch. I don't know how you translate mensch. If anyone knows, stick it in the chat box, but a mensch, you know. Being a mensch means respecting another, no matter the choices they make, or if you do or don't like those choices. Thank you for sharing that, Miriam. I am only going to read one more question from those questions that came in beforehand, because I do want to leave a half hour for the questions from the live crowd over here. Again, you have your chance to put it either in the chat box or you can raise your hand virtually and we will call on you as soon as this last question is answered. Um, we're going to try to keep this program to two hours, so we're doing pretty good on time. And again, we're leaving a full half hour for all of your questions. So this one's a little uh, more juicy, I think. How common are characters like the shady Moshi cousin and the meddling mother-in-law? <laughs> okay, can I split them into two separate questions? The meddling mother-in-law is absolutely awful, and very sadly, she does not only exist in Sutmer Williamsburg. Um, I don't want to insult any beautiful Jewish mamas on this uh, call here, but our tribe is not known for hands off and live and let live. We probably invented the helicopter mom. We probably cop copyrighted the, you know, over-involved schwigger or, or mother-in-law. Um, but that actually, while it may be true, it isn't actually a Jewish value. The Torah value is, and I, and I don't need to elaborate because I think I went over time on the previous question, is to be there for your children in a way your children need not in the way you think they need. Huge difference. Similar sentence, huge difference. Meaning, if you need me, I'm here for you, but I'm not gonna actually be sitting on your shoulder telling you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, and what to wear while you're doing it. Uh, most children find that um, you know, invasive, intrusive, too much, overload, unhealthy. Um, in the series, the mother-in-laws actually caused a lot of harm and a lot of um, added aggravation to SD, a lot of pain that wouldn't have been there if the mother-in-law wasn't trying to be helpful. And I think um, this isn't the Hasidic woman's issue. This may go out for all the Jewish mamas out there. Um, we could probably learn a lesson to dial back those tendencies more and to try to encourage more of a, I'm here for you uh, from a little bit of a distance, which again is not the traditional stereotypical Jewish mother, but we probably will create healthier family dynamics if we could create a little more space and wait for our kids to tell us what they need and want versus um, you know, the very heavy handed hovering um, from the other um, dimension. And that is regarding the mother-in-law, regarding the sketchy Maishi character, Moshi, Maishi, um, that cousin who kind of seems to be straddling the dark side, um, not really winning the struggles. He's a little shady, not a mensch, I would say, um, if we know what, you know. And I think the truth is, this guy or a guy like him exists in every community everywhere on planet earth because every community is made up of humans not angels which means we struggle we fall down we um you know it's not easy and we try to get back up and do the right thing it's uniquely disappointing when you have 
you're a religious community. How could you have someone that's morals and ethics are, are in question? And the answer is that while people aspire to a moral, godly um, life, um, very often the human um, being in us, that animalistic side in us, trips and falls and stumbles and fails. And you will find that everywhere. Um, what you hopefully also will find is people looking to repair, looking to get back to their true selves. And as Rabbi uh, Mendy blew the show for the, the call is to return to ourselves. So if you messed up, if you fell in the mud, if you made a mistake, you're a human. Mazel tov. Welcome to the club. This is how God created us. And if we could get back to our true selves and kind of wipe off the dirt, then we know we're in a good direction. And so, yes, in Hasidic Williamsburg or in any other community, you will find um, characters of all kinds. Although I will be honest and say I didn't really find most of the characters in this uh, series very compelling in terms of like, you didn't want to bring anyone home for a coffee. They were very stiff and rigid and not like warm and juicy, which I don't think is accurate, um, but uh, having a character that is kind of grappling with the dark side, you could see he has some addictions and some um, you know, negative tendencies that he has not uh, sorted out. Um, that is the truth of the human condition. And um, it uh, probably doesn't surprise anyone that humans, even if they have a beard and a black jacket inside, it is not uh, an angel. It is a human striving and trying and looking um, to live up to the ideals of, you know, faith and values and tradition. But uh, a stumble is also always in the cards. And that is why we have Rosh Hashanah to take accounting of where we are and Yom Kippur to kind of reset the new... Uh, slate for the new year and i sure i know i'm praying on everyone's behalf that this coming year for humanity looks way better um in a healthy happy way than all the uh interesting things we faced this past year um physical health spiritual health mental health emotional health financial health etc and i know sarah you mentioned this was the last question um so if we are ready to go to the live um either chat box or in person you let me know um, yes, yes. My Thank you so much for answering all these questions that came in beforehand. They were fascinating to listen to, and it gave us such a good basis to understanding the series. I'm going to hand over the mic now to my husband. He's going to moderate the new questions that come in, again, through chat or through raising your hand. And here is your chance to ask Miriam. All questions are allowed, and we are so excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, so let's get straight into it. We have just a half hour over here. We have a lot of questions that already came in in the chat box and uh, we're so excited. So there were some people that I saw raise their hand and put down their hand throughout the virtual hand we're talking about. So as of now, there's no hands up. So I'm not going to uh, call on people that raised it earlier. Um, although I do see Lisa's hand and maybe we'll give her a permit because she wrote such a beautiful article, but really we're supposed to be raising our virtual hands. But Lisa, let's try to keep it brief, everybody. So we will um, go to Lisa and there you go. Thank you. I can only find clapping and thumbs up. I apologize. Um, I wanted to thank Hani for saying such nice things about me, but really all the hard work was done by Miriam. I just wrote down what she said. Um, my question goes back to something we talked about much, much earlier in the, in the evening about the concept of a man's obligation and a woman's permission um, and intimacy in, in marriage. Something that I have heard over time has to do with the idea that there are various, there are specific reasons for which the male and female partners in a marriage are, I don't know if permitted is the right word, to request a divorce and that the only one that exists for the woman is if her husband is not uh, satisfying her in the intimate part of their relationship. And that just doesn't seem accurate to me, so I'm hoping you can clarify that. Yeah, so I, what I will say two things, because this is actually a very, um, it's focused a lot in, in Talmud and in 
very ancient sources, but also in modern sources, the concept in Judaism of a get does exist. It's, it's elaborated on in many different texts. That is not accurate that that is the only example. Um, although sometimes things are perpetuated and recited and recited that it becomes, um, you know, kind of like, oh, this is true. Um, it isn't accurate. There are many different scenarios that actually could take place. Um, you know, involving all sorts of things, kids, having kids, not having kids, money, financial, providing, not providing, or, or just not getting along in terms of the conventional, we bring out the worst in each other, um, all sorts of different scenarios um, could be, and in fact would be, um, legal grounds for a get. However, um, what's very fascinating and I think most relevant regarding this very complex technical topic is in the last 10 meet really 20, but more so in the last 10 years, almost every rabbi who's conducting a, a, a not Hasidic and not Orthodox, but a traditional wedding that includes a chuppah will encourage a couple to get a Hasidic, not a Hasidic, a halachic prenup. And what that means is it's a very unromantic document. It's as unromantic as a regular prenup is, like kind of dividing up the shekels before we even, you know, endeavor to start this relationship. Not a romantic document, but what the halachic prenup is there to accomplish is that in the event that this relationship does not work out, for her reasons or for his reasons or for both of their reasons. And there are many variables to what those could be. Um, it's not, she gets one, one way out and he gets 10 ways out. It's not that cut and dry at all, um, but that it should be that whatever the reasons are, this is something that should be done as smoothly and seamlessly as possible because it is understood by rabbinical law and by Jewish tradition that a relationship that has crumbled and shattered. There is so much pain there that we don't want to prolong it by legal proceed proceedings and rabbinical counsel and courts and, and all of that. And so a halachic prenup would basically mean this get, which annuls the document of the ketubah, in the event that one or the other are heading out. I mean, they're both heading out. They both, uh, a marriage ends when uh, both are, are leaving it. Um, and that actually also is complicated because that's not always either the case. But um, the, to keep it very simple, what practically applies today is that a halachic prenup is signed so that if this relationship falls apart, no one is trapped, no one is stuck, no one can't get out, or no one can hold another hostage based on the halachic wording or the verbiage or the way it was conducted um, you know, in ancient times. And that is for the simple purpose that again, human life is meant to be treasured. Relationships are supposed to be difficult and meant to be worked through. But if they cannot be, this shouldn't be, a, the Torah shouldn't be providing additional hardship to a couple to have to wiggle and fight and, and, and add more misery to the already challenging issue of a failed relationship. And so that is probably the most relevant um, issue on divorces and gets. And you could probably, you know, Google um, a lot of the halachic details of who, who can provide which excuse, you know, I mean, I thought, Lisa, I thought you were going to go for like, I heard if she burns his dinner, that's grounds to divorce him. Because <laughs> yes, some Talmudic rabbi did make that comment, you know, dinner was burnt, that's it, one strike, you're out. You don't know how to cook, you're really, I mean, it, but really, it's obviously more complex. Um, on both sides. And when, when one statement is kind of taken out of context, um, it, it, it makes the whole Jewish intricate legal system look like, I wouldn't say God forbid a joke, but like for real, the only way she could get out is if, if her sex life sucks, everything else is not a good reason. That's not accurate. So um, I hope that's... Yes, hope that, that answers, that answers okay. and it's lovely to meet of the question. It's lovely you to meet you with the face. Mwah. Okay. <laughs> It All answers 99% right. of the question. Is that, that, is in fact the fact that her sex life sucks a legitimate reason to ask for a divorce? Listen, uh, I, for some people, uh, worse or less things have been cited as reasons. So I suppose I'm, you're right. I'm not going to comment on reasons. I mean, I've heard- Fair enough. Conscious uncoupling. What does that mean? I don't know. We don't, you know, I don't know. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't even give you a reason. It just says we're doing other things now. Okay, done. Thank you. Who am I to comment on your reasons, right? Okay. All right, Lisa, thank you so much. So we're not here to hear me, so I'm gonna keep my remarks uh, brief to none, but we'll go straight to Sylvia, who has her hand raised. Okay, I don't see Sylvia. Hi, Hi I'm, I'm, my name is Sylvie. 
Hi, Sam. I'm from, hi, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. Miriam, thank you so much. And first of all, you got to work on your enthusiasm, okay, and your shyness. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're really out there. I love that. I appreciate it. Um, you know, really, your passion for the topic. I just have a quick story about my own mikvah story. I didn't know you got you were going to talk a lot about that, but um, so I lived for many years in New York City, and I would go religiously to the Upper West Side. And back then, it was a real dump, you know, over there. But I went anyway. And the the mikvah lady, she was, you know, from like off the boat from somewhere, and she really knew everybody's story, like everybody. She wasn't being nosy, but she was really. And I had three miscarriages. And um, she said, uh, she gave me a number one day. She goes, yeah, I want you to call this doctor, you know, herself. And I didn't, but I, um, I went back and one day there was a woman there and she said, it's customary for some women in their ninth month just to go in for a dunking, you know? And this woman was there and she asked the woman, would you go in the water and, and pray with me? So as I went in for my monthly, you know, soak, she had this big nine month pregnant woman pray for me and i got pregnant six weeks later wow so just want to tell you it was a really you know it's, it was just a really good story it was a real spiritual experience for me wow. and i i went in my ninth month hoping to pass that on to somebody else but that didn't happen right you know me. that's very interesting because i get asked about that custom is it a thing i've heard of it and now i could say sylvie from boulder colorado actually experienced <laughs> that and i'm guessing you didn't say the finale mazel tov uh, uh, a bouncing baby boy, boy girl. Yes. okay boy. <laughs> yeah um that's yeah. beautiful and i guess that's the positive um you know you said in a beautiful way that she wasn't being nosy, she was being caring. And that's right. what you hope, that someone doesn't make you feel invaded, someone makes you feel nurtured and cared for, which I think is what you're expressing. And that's, again, how it should be when it's done right. And I think you also, your face is shining beautifully when you said it's a dump, but you went anyway. I'm very glad to report <laughs> now that. Now it's today. not, they, they right. made it nice now. <laughs> exactly, so I'm gonna say today, it's very rare to find a dump mikvah, yeah. but kudos to you that you went even when it was a dump, <laughs> now they're, they're pretty spa like you know yeah, they are yeah. um, and that's beautiful and i'm so happy you shared that thank you that's very beautiful and i'm i'm glad i could say i know someone that yeah. this custom not just uh it was a theory but it actually seemed to have uh did the job yeah it did the job thank you okay. thank you sylvie from boulder appreciate uh you sharing that beautiful story um so we'll get straight to some of the questions that came in from the chat so I'm actually combining a few questions over here that are associated because we have quite a few that came in and we only have about 20 minutes left. So the question is as follows. How does the Hasidic community actually um, deal with people that decided to leave the community? And there's another question, which I'm putting in the same one, but you could uh, separate it. How do you react to a Jewish community who excommunicate one of their own? Okay, so it, it's, a little, it's a little sketchy when you kind of, make a community responsible for an individual. Because on one hand, we have a Jewish value, call Yisrael, Arabim, Zelazan, we're responsible for one another, and we should care about one another, and we should be concerned about one another. That's a, you know, a communal obligation. On the other hand, a community, um, what is their kind of, where is that line drawn when it comes to an individual choices and decisions by one person and one member. And I think what's fair and accurate to say, just because it's close knit and very often families and schools and synagogues, everyone knows each other. Um, and so it's more of an entanglement when you want to kind of leave that behind, it will come with a lot of strings um, versus someone who grew up, I don't know if it's a thing, community -less, but without that very strong infrastructure. So there's a real beauty to that strength and that feeling of belonging, but there's also that challenge when someone chooses something other than the community. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, the individual makes their choices for their lives not the community and hopefully the individual makes the choices for their life based on what god and what their morals and values in the torah have taught them not on public opinion so the bottom line is one should not conduct their life by what will the neighbors say whether it's the kardashians the cohen's or the kleins but rather what is my obligation as a human being and that should be my guiding light in the world is my community going to frown if i do x y or z that shouldn't be the question 
the question. The question needs to be, what does God want of me and my understanding of my relationship with Hashem, which I'm always supposed to be nurturing and growing and strengthening. So I'm not saying this isn't something to address. I'm just saying that communities need to have less of a role in a human being's life than Hashem does. And if you let your decisions be guided by communal thought or popular opinion or what your neighbors down the block will think, that is not a Jewish um, you know, approach in general, because that is, that is kind of where um, you see the downside of what a community could provide. And really a community is there to provide the positives and the good. Um, I know there was a second element to your to your question, um, but I don't remember the nuance of what it was. Now, the two sides of the question was one: how does the community actually act, which is what you um, responded to, and the second side was how should we react if we see a different, say, community? But by saying, by your answer, I think you kind of answered that as well uh, by mistake by just saying that, that that concept doesn't really exist. But either the question, I'll just rephrase it. How do you react to a Jewish community who excommunicate one of their own? Right. So that, okay, so that's very, that's much more specific. And there is, um, you know, in Jewish tradition, there is a concept where someone is so beyond the pale that they're like, you know, you got to kind of stand outside the camp. But that is absolutely um, an extreme example of not just inappropriate or I don't like your choices. We're talking their murder. We're talking their like big um, issues. And even that, again, what Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur teach us is there's never someone so lost or so far gone that there isn't a road back. Um, but bottom line is that community opinion needs to take second stage to the right thing to do and to what God wants of me and to what feels true in my heart and my neshama. And I think we all get lost when we value our neighbor's opinion over our creator's opinion. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next one. What are we doing as Jewish women to help the small minority of women who are suffering abuse? Only one Jew is suffering, we are all suffering. Yes, so that is absolutely true. And I think each and every one of us in our own circles, in our own you know, spheres of influence, when you are alerted to a situation where there's an individual suffering, man, woman, or child, um, it is incumbent upon us um, to not say, you know, it's in God's hands, it's not my business, it's not really, you know, I wasn't asked, who am I to step in? That is not the Jewish approach. The Jewish approach is if it came across your desk, that means you have a role to play in either facilitating help, passing it on to someone who could help, and interfering and never saying it's not my department, doing whatever we can in whatever ways we can, big or small, whether that means picking up a phone, making a call, giving money, reaching out, making a connection, providing a service, a, a counselor, a therapist, notifying people. There's so many, depending on the situation, the action will look different, but every single one of us has a moral obligation to be of assistance and to help any anybody struggling in any abusive situation um, to help them get the resources they need to get out of it and no one should ever be um, you know just kind of left to, to struggle on their own that is not uh, that is not the, 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 the way the Torah instructs us to live as community members 100 percent uh, the next one is, I'm just going to read it straight out because it's just an observation. I watch a lot of Israeli and Jewish themed films and can testify that aside from the one film that most people loved and didn't have a negative perspective of religious life was Ushpizen, which is kind of the ex exception that proves the rule in the sense that the writing of most of these films does come from a critical agenda, not just for dramatic interest, but to express their dislike or disdain for Orthodox life. And therefore, if watched, people should be aware of this perspective. Um, I will just add to that, sorry for uh, chiming in for a second over here, that a few people, some of them I noticed on the chat from our community, said you got to watch Stissel. Stissel is where it's at, where they um, portrayed a little bit of a more uh, nuanced or positive uh, light. So I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or I could just go straight to the next question. No, I, I've, I, I could just say that one of the, aside for the fundamental storyline of unorthodox, which is painful and it's heartbreaking to, to watch a story of someone suffering um, and that's just painful. And then all the characters, mother, father, sister, brother, grandmother, everybody has their own, um, you know, dysfunction. No one was warm. And I think a contrast to that is Schistel, whatever the storyline is, they're juicy characters. They're warm. If they came to your house, you wouldn't mind schmoozing and having a coffee. If anyone from unorthodox came, we're, I'm very hospitable, but I would be looking at my clock. Like, when are we going to, you know, 
say hasta la vista because like, ugh, very, very, you know, just uptight, uncomfortable. And I don't think that's true. I think you go to Mayashara and you go to Williamsburg, you don't need me to tell you. People have personalities. They're, they're out there. They, they're, they're, there's all sorts of characters with all sorts of senses of humor and, and wisdom and wit and, and mishagasin and craziness, but it's, it's rich people, not dry puppets, which is kind of how I, I felt that, but uh, I'm glad there's something out there that has some characters. Um, I can't, I'm not an expert. I haven't really uh, seen uh, enough to comment, but um, I'm glad there are some other alternative uh, entertainment where Orthodox people are not looked looking absolutely awful in every sense of the word. So, uh, yeah, this is definitely true. I'm going to, the next couple questions I'm going to do are all, they seem to be, the responses should be relatively short so we can get in a few. Let's go one at a time. Do you view the series as having positive and meaningful opportunities such as these for outreach and education? Yes. <laughs> that is the best part of the series is that people wanted to talk about Jewish values, at least from my perspective. Um, it interests people enough. It had people curious enough to want to know more. And I think in that way, it did a huge service. Um, I don't know what it did to anti-Semitism. It may have spiked it. I don't know what it did to people's general observation of traditional life. I certainly know that no one looked too uh, normal or healthy or wonderful to me. I know that from my own parents, if um, they saw joy and meaning and beauty in a traditional life. If they saw unorthodox, I don't know that that would have been a life they wanted to sign up for. Um, could probably answer that one. And, um, you know, again, but there's, there's a silver lining and there's a, something positive that can be drawn even from, um, you know, a show that kind of casts people in a negative light. And I don't know if this is a question, but I do just want to comment because we're doing so well with time. Um, we're not out of time yet. Um, and that is that, if you do have a chance at some point to go to Williamsburg, what you will notice, which did not come across on the screen at all, is even though the women in Williamsburg were dressed very modestly and conservatively, which is true, they're not wearing ripped jeans and, you know, boy band t-shirts, um, they actually don't look like they were shopping at the Goodwill, which is what they looked like to me in the series. The women in Williamsburg are actually dressed with expensive, I wouldn't say designer, but they value high quality clothing. And even if it's modest and conservative and maybe navy blue, um, it's actually usually beautiful. They usually have you know, Italian designer shoes. Their kids are matching. They, they value quality. And even in the, you know, these are just externals, but just to give you a sense of what was missing, the strimal, which is the uh, Hasidic uh, fur hat, and I'm not commenting on the PETA ethical element. I'm just commenting on the look. Um, a fur hat looks soft. Those, you know, hats seen in the film looked like spiky, I don't know, it looked like something um, that you wouldn't ever want to touch because it had like very severe sticky spikes. Um, I didn't think the costuming was uh, so, so authentic to what you would really see. And that's just an external reflection of the internal truths that also weren't really um, very clear or, or very much not presented in a context, at least to me, I'm sure people have all sorts of opinions on what they felt when they were seeing that. And that is because two Jews, three opinions. We've got to keep it that way. All right. Is a Jewish woman who is a widow permitted to showing their hair again, or are they required to maintain the wig? So there are definitely halachic opinions that say once a woman's married um, forever after, even if that marriage ends, divorce or widow or something, um, that that sensuality is not ever expressed in a public format again. Um, there are definitely halachic authorities that differ and say that if a woman is not in um, an intimate relationship, then her the sacredness of her hair and that privacy isn't as relevant. But there is, as with many things in Judaism, opinions. You know, you ask Rambam, ask Rashi, ask there's different um, opinions, and you will find both, and you will find women who are in that situation kind of practicing, um, you know, in one way or the other. That's right. A little calm would I can tell you that. All right, I see Yael is raising her hand, so let's go to Yael. Hi, thank you for, um, thank you for inviting me into the chat for a few seconds. Um, I, I mean, everything that was said here was so beautiful. I just want to comment about that, but um, from when you were saying about, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the name of the speaker, Miss Revitin. Just Miriam's good. Okay, Miriam. So when you were speaking about 
uh, the Hasidic community and women not necessarily shaving their heads. Um, and going, you know, if you go to Israel, you see different color tichels and whatnot. I, I was very close to some, I was blessed to be very close to some women in Maya Sharim. And it's, I mean, it seemed that there were many, not, not all the women in Israel, obviously, as you said, shaved their head. However, um, there was a great chunk, especially of the breast love community, the women in Maya Sharm, you see their tichels are flat. However, she did explain to me why they're doing this is to, uh, to make sure that there's no, um, and you can explain the word to uh, um, um, the people you're speaking to, Rabbi Chatzitza, when they go into the mikvahs. And she felt that that, was, she, that touched her in a very deep way, and they thought it was very beautiful. So right. I know, yeah. No, so Yael, I appreciate you. I appreciate you mentioning that, and it is true that in Babov or Satmar and a few other of the um, Hasidic um, sects, that that custom is upheld. I do want to say that when I've spoken to women who actually do do this, you know, head shaving, and they sound very, you know, proud, and they feel it's a beautiful mitzvah, and I think it's actually reflected accurately in the Unorthodox series, not by Esti's face, but you notice when her head is being shaved, there are two little girls or young girls that are maybe cousins in the room, and what struck me about them is I was looking with horror on my face. I felt it. I was like, oh my gosh, I was cringing because like her hair is getting scalped off, and it looked very uncomfortable it, not not physically emotionally but the two girls in the room looked at it like a very you know rite of passage like this is what we do they didn't look their looks on their faces were very natural as I would imagine you know think of a rite of passage or a ritual in a some you know I don't know a a foreign country or a community, a, a reserve that you don't know. And it might look very bizarre to the outsider, but someone in that community where it's practiced and it's normal, the husbands, the wives, the brothers, the sons, the daughters, they know this is what's done. And so their perception of it is not the same as, so to speak, an outsider's. But I do want to mention one other thing. While there's beauty in every custom and customs are maintained, sometimes because my mother did it, I'm going to do it. Um, there's also a halachic um, issue raised with a woman doing something that would um, either to herself make her feel less than attractive or to her spouse, um, yeah. kind of halacha doesn't look favorably on a woman who would do something to kind of make themselves look unattractive. And so there's a big discussion in a halachic uh, context that this is even allowed. Now, the bottom line is, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, there are still communities, whether it's in Meir Sharm or in Williamsburg, where women will do this. And I spoke to Satwar women. Some said that they still do it after the wedding, but then their hair will maybe grow back in and they may not do it continuously. Um, some said they would continuously do it. Some said the younger ones aren't doing it as much as their grandmothers. I've heard a lot of different things, but the bottom line is um, there's a lot of room for just discussion of, of different viewpoints on why and what and how. And I think that if a woman is choosing to do whatever the custom is, if it looks bizarre to me or you, but she feels that there's a beauty and there's a meaning and there's a joy, we have to view that the same way we would view anybody else's tradition, customs, or values as foreign or strange as they may be to us, to again, see the neshama, see the soul of the person. And if this has meaning for you or your community or your heritage, I respect that. I may not do that and I might not really, really get why you do, but I can appreciate um, that, that we can, you know, so to speak, agree to disagree and have a mutual respect um, for that idea of maintaining something. And every, I want you to know, because I've spoken to summer women, even though the women in my community, uh, the Chabad community, do not do that period, um, many of them spoke with, you know, the, with positivity and, 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 a, and a respect and a reverence to it. And it is what it is. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing, particularly the part about the halachic part, whether it's permissive, a question whether it's permissible or not to shave your head if your husband wouldn't like it. It's been a discussion. Or you, or you wouldn't like it. it. It's a real discussion, and the rabbinical conclusions are not, um, I mean, you can, you can look them up yourself, but uh, a lot of the rabbinical opinions are you can't do something that will make you feel or look um, unattractive. That is what some authorities say, but obviously you can always find, um, you know, a path. Uh, towards towards the tradition that you are are pursuing, and that is the beauty of all the different ways that Jews practice and all the way that Jews celebrate their tradition. And I think we need to respect um, respect that, and we're all stronger 
um, as a family when we can do that. I mean, thank you. So this is a, a fascinating evening and we're enjoying every moment, but unfortunately the clock is still moving. So we're gonna have to start wrapping up. So I wanna first uh, ask a final question from the ones that came in. There are quite a few that I unfortunately couldn't get to. Some seem to also take a little bit leng uh, lengthier answers to um, get to them. But let's go to this one right here. Um, in, if you had to choose one thing that you think the creators of the series got the most either right or wrong, you choose, what would that one thing be? Um, I'm, I'm not thinking deeply here. It's just coming off the cuff here, but I really like the Yiddish um, element that I thought was pretty authentic, even though my own Yiddish is not Hungarian. It's uh, more of a Russian accent, but I love that there was a series created in Yiddish where anyone watching got that flavor. I thought they did that well and right, and that was something different and maybe part of the intrigue that you know, a lot of people are like, let's watch this in this language. Um, we spoke a lot about what, um, you know, I feel wasn't accurately depicted, so we'll leave that. But I, I would say thumbs up definitely to the, um, the Yiddish speaking and the dialect in terms of like the nuances, the kvetching, the oi, the ich, the ech. Um, I think they, they did a, a pretty nice job with the Yiddish, so I'm gonna give them a thumbs up on that. Um, and if you're, if you, I know you said it was the last question, so if that's the case, considering that the topic was unorthodox, the orthodox thing, or at least the halakhic thing um, that I was told has to happen on every Zoom call is a l'chaim has to be made, because that is, uh, that's the custom, and you always want to do the custom. So I want to make a l'chaim to everyone. Um, firstly, the l'chaim itself is the message, and that is that the word l'chaim does not mean cheers in Hebrew. It's not like you say cheers, I say l'chaim. L'chaim comes from the word chai, which means life or the numerical 18, as many of you probably, you know, it's a Jewish number, lucky number chai, but really l'chaim teaches us that life lived is in the plural because l'chaim is when you take chai, life, but you pluralize it. You actually have the diversity of community, of different opinions and backgrounds and beliefs and practices. And that's actually where you see color and flavor and joy. And so I want to say l'chaim to each and every one of the beautiful um, members of the different communities here, but all part of our same collective family, that this year coming up uh, soon should be filled with an abundance of blessing for each and every one of us in good health, spiritual health, and physical health, and financial health and educational health and all the different ways that we want our, our uh, lives to be healthy. And most importantly, that our neshama, which is the essence of who we are, should actually, that light should shine outwards and should be reflected back with peace and harmony in our world. The light in the world, the truth in our world should actually be revealed. And so the, the traditional uh, l'chaim is that we always toast, that we, we bless one another, we should all merit the coming of Mashiach. And that sounds scary, like, oh no, what's Mashiach? Some, you know, oh, there's a ch in there, and what does it mean? What does it mean? It means we should be blessed to have a world where the truth and the light is as simple and plain and clear as day as the other stuff we see in our world. That's what we're hoping for. The true reality that's inside of us and outside of us should actually be what we see and how we interact um, with ourselves, with our community, with our world. And so l'chaim, that it should be a beautiful new year ahead in good health for everybody that needs it for them for their children for their parents for their siblings for their colleagues for the entire universe so l'chaim it should be truly l'shana tova ubetuka and um and i just need to say this even though yeah i have 60 seconds yeah um the the traditional jewish uh greeting l'shana tova umetuka it should be a good and sweet year is redundant if it's good tov then it's matok, then it's sweet. Why do you need both, right? What, what, what are we just throwing extra words around? And the simple answer is from a Hasidic perspective is good is always the case because we might not see it, but it's good on God's level. But what, that's not what we're asking for. We don't want it good on God's level, on God's viewpoint, on that vantage point. We want it sweet that we taste it, that we actually can look at something and say, ah, this tastes sweet to me. This is good for me. Not, I know there's a good reason and outcome 
That's a lot of work. That's not what we're asking for. We're asking for the goodness should come in a package of sweetness that we actually could appreciate. So l'chaim to that. And thank you to the Turins and to the Shiners and to the beautiful communities in Colorado and Springfield and an open invite when everything opens up. If you ever want to visit us in Atlanta, we, are, we have a tent, so the door literally is always open. You just flap in, and we would love to have you and host you um, in, the, in the deep south, l'chaim, and it should be a beautiful year for everyone. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, before I pass the mic right back to my dear mother-in-law and my dear wife, I want to ask one person that was waiting so nicely, Gail, to give us a final question. It's not from the chat, so she has to do it in person. And I oh, it's also not. want to send you regards from Patrice, who now lives in Springfield, who's on the chat, and who wants to interview you for the Atlanta Jewish News. All right, Gail. So, um, greetings from Miami Beach. So I'm farther <laughs> south than you are. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a question. I just had a comment. Um, I, like so many others, read the book when it came out through the Hadassah Book Club that I belong to. And I would recommend for those who saw the movie to really read the book because there was so much more in the book and much more of a broader perspective. Um, and again, I you know, was disappointed in, in all the European, which I guess I shouldn't have been, but after reading the book, there's just a lot more to absorb. So that's what, I don't know if you, if you say that in, when you talk to, when you give these, I know you've given a lot of them, um, but I think that's important. Yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that. And there's actually, you know, a lot Thank of- Thank you for sharing that, Gail. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thanks, Gail. Thank you so much, Miriam, for an amazing evening. I'm so happy we were able to cover such important topics and so much light and clarity. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving of your time, of your wisdom, and for uniting both communities in Boulder and in Springfield, and of course, many others from around the world who joined as well. I'm going to pass the mic to my mother if she wants to add anything to my closing remarks, and then I will wish everyone a good evening and a Shana Tova and all the blessings that Miriam so eloquently related should be fulfilled and this year should be better than ever. Amen. So just to end, I just have to say again, Alechayim, yes, this month, we're, all those beautiful brachos that we all need. I think this year when we're going to be praying, whether at home or um, outside or physically distant or whatever we're going to do, um, I think we're going to take it more seriously because uh, this has been quite a year and God willing, next year is going to be an amazing year, only full of blessings, only full of good surprises and Mashiach. So that would be the best surprise ever. I just, I can't believe how fast the time flew by. So yes, we were all sitting in our virtual living rooms and we united as a community. And I, I've heard lots of speakers. I've heard this topic. I'm actually very passionate about this topic, just like Sarah is. And some of you are, and I look forward to, um, to some of the people who ever wants to continue the conversation privately. Um, totally, in, you know, I, I'm, I, I just felt that Miriam did a fantastic job so eloquently. She covered so many different points and I kept on in my physical, well, this is a synagogue actually, but the, even in the, the space, a virtual space, kept on thinking, yes, right on. She really understood the topics. She understood the, it was, it's complex. And there was a lot of gray areas and she really, um, it, was, it was, I was really blown away. So thank you so much. We look forward to have, hosting you physically without social distancing um, or maybe a different time for a different topic online. But thank you very much. And I wish everybody a good night and I look forward to being in touch um, on a real level to some of the people who joined. Have a wonderful year. Thank you.